Hi guys, we're going to talk about personality disorders in chapter 24. And I think the main takeaway from this is just trying to distinguish the clusters. Each cluster has a set of personality disorders, but each cluster has a set of behaviors that are related to those personality disorders. So let's just get started here. Personality comes from the Latin word persona, meaning mask. Individuals' characteristic patterns of relatively permanent thoughts, feelings, and behavior. This defines his or her quality of experiences and relationships. A person is considered unhealthy when interpersonal and social relationships and functioning become maladaptive, complicated, or dysphoric. Personality disorders are the most challenging and complex group of disorders to treat. Individuals who meet the criteria for these disorders display significant challenges in self-identity or self-direction, problems with empathy and intimacy, broken down in three clusters of similar behavior patterns and personality traits. So, cluster A are odd and eccentric behaviors. That's going to fit our paranoid, schizoid, and schizotypal. Cluster B are our dramatic, emotional, and erratic behaviors. And that's going to consist of borderline, narcissistic, histrionic, and antisocial. And then the last cluster we'll talk about is cluster C. These are anxious and fearful behaviors. And those behaviors will manifest in avoidant, dependent, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So let's talk about cluster A. Remembering that these personality disorders are eccentric and have very odd behaviors. So paranoid personality disorder uh, prevalence is about 2 to 4 percent. It's usually greater in males than in females. It often precedes a schizophrenia diagnosis. So some characteristics that we can think about with paranoid personality disorder are they have a long-standing distrust and suspiciousness of others. They believe that others want to exploit, harm, or deceive them. They are very hypervigilant, they anticipate hostility, and they may even provoke hostile responses. They're very reluctant to share information because of that fear it will be used against them. That may be a parent in childhood. So this is the child that may show no signs of friends, have social anxiety, maybe they're frequently teased. And then as adults, relationships are difficult to maintain because of jealousy, or some controlling behaviors. They are also unwilling to forgive and they do project, or they have projection of feeling. That's usually their dominant defense mechanism. So what are some of the guidelines for nursing care? We need to counteract this mistrust by um, adhering to schedules, meaning we need to follow through with our promises and adhere to those schedules. If we tell them that we're gonna be back at 10.05, um, to check on them, we need to be back at 10.05 to check on them. If we're telling them that we're coming at 2.30 to take them for group therapy, we need to be there right at 2.30 to take them to group therapy. So make sure that we're adhering to those schedules. Um, we need to avoid being over-friendly. Um, being over-friendly can, cre can create suspiciousness. And then we want to make sure that we're projecting a neutral but kind affect, giving clear, straightforward explanations using simple language, and then limit setting is essential for these patients. So then how do we treat them? Psychotherapy is usually the first uh, line of treatment for paranoid personality disorder. Individual therapy helps develop professional and trusting relationships. Group therapy may be threatening. However, social skills may be improved. Some short-term antidepressants may be helpful. So this is just a mnemonic that um, I threw in for each of these, hopefully to help you just solidify um, some of those symptoms. 
So the next one we're going to talk about is schizoid personality disorder. And this is a prevalence of about 5% of our population. And they really exhibit a lifelong pattern of social withdrawal. They're expressionless. These are individuals that people will describe as odd or eccentric because of how uncomfortable they are in social situations. Again, this does hit males greater than females. And some of those, again, characteristics are um, symptoms appear typically in our childhood or adolescent. Loners, poor academic performance. They're usually the objects of ridicule because of those odd behaviors. They typically do not seek out close relationships. They have numerous imaginary friends and fantasies. They are observer, they are an observer rather than a participant in life. A lot of times they have feelings of depersonalization or detachment from oneself and the world. So what are some of the guidelines for nurses? We want to make sure we're avoiding being too nice or too friendly. Um, we don't want to increase socialization too quickly. While group therapy, um, is an okay choice it's not our first treatment choice um, we really got to do a lot of individual work um, we want to assess for symptoms that the patient is reluctant to discuss um, if they're reluctant to discuss it maybe it's a trend that could um, lead us on to why they behave the way they're behaving and then we want to protect them against the group's ridicule um, remembering that um, they may be very silent they may act awkward in a group setting um, and so we just need to protect them from that ridicule that could happen as far as treatment we can think about um, psychotherapy group therapy again making sure we have individual work done first and then maybe some antidepressants could also be helpful so again here's just another mnemonic to try to help you understand and relate schizoid personality disorder so the last one we're going to talk about in cluster A is schizotypal disorder. Um, these patients do not blend well with the crowd. Their symptoms are strikingly strange and very unusual. They are very magical thinkers. They will think he caught a cold because I wished he would, right? That's magical thinking. They have very odd beliefs, which make them, which makes them overly superstitious. They have strange speech patterns and they can be very inappropriate affect are those hallmark symptoms. The prevalence is about 0.6 to 4.6. Again, males greater than females. As far as characteristics, um, we can talk about severe social and interpersonal deficits, anxiety in social situations. They'll have rambling conversations with lengthy, unclear, overly detailed and abstract content. They can display paranoia, suspiciousness, anxiety, and distrust. Um, that motivation of others as being out to get them. They have brief intermittent episodes of hallucinations or delusions. They can be made aware of those odd beliefs, suspiciousness, and magical thinking. And a lot of times they'll be involved in these cults um, groups um, because of those supernatural beliefs. Um, so they could be very vulnerable to the cult groups, or they may actually be participants. So as far as nursing um, care guidelines, we want to be aware that strange beliefs, strange religious practices, peculiar thoughts may be a part of this patient's life. And we have to withhold judgment and ridicule. We have to respect the patient's need for that social isolation um, be aware of that suspiciousness, and again, just withholding judgment or ridicule. As far as treatment, we can think about psychotherapy. Um, be aware of any active involvement in cults or unusual religious groups. There is no medication usually associated with treatment. Sometimes we can do a low dose of antipsychotics, which could just help with symptoms to get them through the day-to-day -day functioning. And again, here is your mnemonic to help you just remember schizotypal personality. So that concludes cluster A, odd and eccentric. 
So now we're going to move to cluster B. These, uh, this cluster is going to have very drama, lots of drama, very dramatic, emotional, and erratic behaviors. And you can see there are four listed. So we're just going to get through each of those. So the first one we're going to talk about is histrionic personality. Um, prevalence is about 2% of the population. Females now greater than males. Characteristics of this one, they are excitable, they are dramatic, but they are high functioning. So they are getting through day-to-day -day life events, but it is in a very excitable, dramatic notion. They are usually referred to as our drama queens or drama majors. They have very bold external behaviors, extrovert, flamboyant, very colorful personalities. But despite that bold exterior, they have very limited ability to, to, to develop meaningful relationships. They are very attention-seeking, self-centered, they have very low frustration tolerance. They're often impulsive. They may act flirtatious or provocative. Relationships typically don't last because the partner feels so smothered. This individual has really no insight into the disorder or role in breaking up the relationship. So what are some guidelines for nursing care? We need to know that seductive behavior is a response to some type of distress. We need to keep our interactions professional and try to ignore all of the excited drama um, flirtatiousness that might be going on. Model that concrete language, help patients clearly um, see those inner feelings, teach and role model assertiveness, and assess for any suicidal ideations. As far as treatment, individuals with histrionic may be out of touch with their feelings. So psycho psychotherapy is treatment of choice. We wanna help promote clarification of those inner feelings and appropriate expressions. Group therapy may be helpful, but it could be very distracting depending on the symptoms that could be very disruptive to the group. And there are no specific pharmacological treatments for this disorder. And here's your mnemonic, I crave sin, to just help you understand and solidify. So the next one, next one is narcissistic personality disorder, zero to 6% prevalent, males greater than females. Characteristics of this one is that feeling of entitlement. They have exaggerated beliefs in one's own importance. They have a lack of empathy. Um, a, the combination of these may result in exploitation of others. So in reality, they are usually suffering from very weak self-esteem and hypersensitivity to criticism. They come across as arrogant and having an inflated view of self-importance with a high need of constant admiration. This is a strain for most relationships over time. Individuals with this disorder have less functioning impairment than other personality disorders. But underneath all of this arrogance, there's really intense feelings of shame and fear of abandonment that could be felt. So what are some of the guidelines? We can think about remaining neutral with these patients. Um, remember their self, ego, or arrogant is going to come out. So try to remain neutral. Try to uh, promote a stronger patient self-identity because you know deep down they have that really low self-esteem. Um, avoid power struggles. They're going to be, they're not going to have any empathy. They're going to try to struggle because everything they say or do is correct. So avoid those power struggles or they may become very defensive. And then we need to try to role model some of that empathy. As far as treatment, treatment's pretty difficult because we need our patients to confront their problem in order to make progress. Because these individuals are not likely to seek help, they may be more involved in couple or family therapy rather than individual therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy can be very helpful for deconstructing that faulty thinking. Group therapy can also see their own qualities in others and they can help learn empathy. Lithium it can be used for mood swings. Antidepressants could be used for symptoms of depression. 
And here's your narcissistic mnemonic. <clears throat> so the two most challenging cluster B disorders are borderline personality and antisocial personality. So as far as borderline personality, this one is most well known and dramatic of the personality disorders. It's typically characterized by severe impairments in functioning, so marked instability in emotional control, they're impulsive, they have self-image distortion, they have unstable mood and interpersonal relationships. The primary feature is emotional liability and impulsivity. Emotional liability is that rapid movement between emotions. Emotions could be out of proportion to their circumstance, pathological fear of separation or intense sensitivity to personal rejection, Impulsivity is that they quickly act in response to the emotion without any consideration to the consequence. Self-destructive behaviors are prominent, um, cutting, promiscuous sexual behaviors, substance numbing that can cause unintentional death. Feelings of antagonism, they're very hostile, angry, and irritable in relationships. Unusual feature is splitting for borderline. Splitting is that, inabil is that sorry, inability to view both positive and negative aspects of others as part of the, their world. Um, so you are either a wonderful, wonderful nurse or you are horrible. There's nothing in between. And so that's what that splitting feature is that we will sometimes see with our borderline personality disorders. So as far as prevalence, 1.6%. Um, comorbidities, we can think about 10% suicide and mortality rate, which is pretty high. 70% will attempt suicide. And borderline personality disorders have typically another mental illness. Uh, substance use disorder constitutes for about 50% of this po patient population as well. As far as risk factors, five times more common in first degree biological relatives. So if you have a biological relative with borderline, you have a five time more risk that you will also develop it. Um, disruption and separation from parents tend to, be, tend to be able to find individuation. <coughs> when we apply the nursing process, we'll start with our assessment. Um, the assessment starts with a semi-structured interview. We're gonna use uh, self-reported inventory, such as the MMPI, because they have built-in validity and reliability scales to help interpret those results. Once we've gotten a good assessment, then we're gonna analyze that data. Remember, we're gonna do safety first. Um, self, are they at risk for self-mutilation or are they already self-mutilating? That would be our um, big safety as far as risk for suicide or self or other directed violence. Um, just safety comes first after we've done our big assessment. As far as outcomes and planning, um, we need to have realistic outcomes that need to be individualized um, based off of measure improvement. Um, so do we need to improve mutilation? Do we need to improve aggression or suicidal thoughts? A therapeutic relationship is essential Remember, most of these patients have experienced some type of failed relationship. So be aware of manipulative behaviors such as flattery, seductiveness, or guilt. And then we want to implement um, our interventions, making sure that we're providing clear and constant boundaries. We're using clear, straightforward communication with these patients. Um, remember, they don't have any impulse control. There's no impulse control. So being clear and consistent with boundaries and limits, um, being very matter of fact. If behavioral problems emerge, we're gonna calmly review those therapeutic goals and we're gonna make sure that we have a really good team working with this patient. Knowing that the primary goal is managing the patient's affect in a group setting, developing coping skills, socializing, these are all helpful for our patients. 
as nurses start bandaging or maybe taking care of those self-inflicted wounds, um, you want to make sure you're responding very matter-of-factly. We don't want to provide any positive reinforcements for that self-mutilation. As far as treatment modalities for borderline, we can think about biological treatments. There are no medications that are specifically approved for borderline. Psychotropic mood stabilizing medications are geared towards maintaining cognitive function, symptom relief, and improved quality of life. We can think about psychotherapy. Um, CBT can help individuals identify and change perceptions of themselves and others. Um, DBT or dialectical behavioral therapy is mindfulness therapy. So just being more aware of their thoughts and reshaping them. This can also help individuals manage distress and help improve those interpersonal relationships. And then the schema focused therapy is reframing the way they see themselves. So again, here's your mnemonic page for borderline personality. I raised a pain. We'll help you just think about those signs and symptoms. And then the last one in cluster B that we're going to talk about is antisocial personality. Um, antisocial has a significant social impact. They have a pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others. These individuals are commonly referred to as sociopaths. Some of the characteristics, um, the main pathological trait that characterizes antisocial personality are antagonistic behaviors, such as being deceitful, manipulative for their own personal gain or hostile if needs are blocked. This disorder, this disorder is also characterized by disinhibited behaviors, such as high risk taking, disregard for responsibility and impulsivity. Criminal misconduct and substance abuse are common with this population. They have a profound lack of uh, lack, sorry, they have a profound lack of empathy known as callousness. This is the total lack of concern about the feelings of others, absence of remorse or guilt, unless they're facing punishment. They have a total disregard for other obligations. They exhibit shallow, unexpressive, and superficial affect. They may also adapt themselves to portray uh, concern and caring if these attributes help manipulate and exploit others. Symptoms typically peak in that mid-teens to 20s, um, and then they usually improve by the time that they hit 40. When we apply the nursing process and we think about assessment, individuals with antisocial personality disorder do not seek treatment unless they're usually court ordered. So as we're keeping that in mind, questions may not be answered honestly and individuals may become very defensive. When we think about self-assessment, we need to remember that these individuals may be very charming. So you may find that you are defending or feel like they are being treated unfairly. Nurses must be aware of their criminal history, um, and if they feel threatened, they need to be aware of that. These feelings need to be explored with faculty or other experienced staff. So once we've done our assessment, we will analyze that, and again, we're gonna focus on that safety, maintaining that safety and providing structure. The success of outcomes um, or the success of achieving these outcomes is pretty difficult with this population of individuals. Maintaining safety is a priority. Small steps and changes will hopefully lead to progression. But it's going to be small steps, a little bit at a time. Hopefully we'll start seeing some progression in um, becoming better. As far as planning and implementation, uh, we can think about boundaries, consistency, support, and limits. This is really essential for all staff members to follow. Remember, these patients will attempt to manipulate <clears throat> if they are not getting what they want. So we've got to set those boundaries. We have to be consistent, and we have to set those limits as a team. 
Giving realistic choices will help them enhance adherence. You can go to this group therapy today or this one, right? It's a realistic choice, but they've got to go to group therapy. Teamwork and safety is our prime intervention. Um, safety is always prime consideration. All team members, again, have to be consistent with the treatment plan. As far as therapeutic communication versus manipulation, we need to address any manipulative behaviors, especially if it's bullying behaviors. Um, maybe they're going to lose some privileges. So openly saying um, if they can't get those behaviors under control, they're going to lose some privileges that, they're, that they enjoy having. Anticipate and seek team support for aggressive behaviors and reduce uh, their anxiety and anger through physical outlets. Pharmacological interventions uh, may respond to mood stabilizers, lithium, valproic acid, <coughs> excuse me, acid to help with aggression, depression, and impulsivity. And then once we've gone through all of that, we've intervened, then we have to reevaluate. Um, that can be difficult um, to do. Motivations, um, motivation patients may learn to change those behaviors. So, as far as treatment modality, there's no specific medications. Mood stabilizers we talked about to help with aggression. Um, we can also provide some SSRIs or benzos or Ritalin, and then we can think about psycho psychological therapies. There is some evidence that these patient, this patient population will bond with their psychotherapist, and this bond can help improve thinking and behaviors. Um, a specific form of CBT, mentalization behavioral therapy, um, are long-term treatments that support that individual's ability to recognize and understand their own and other people's mental states, as well as help them examine thoughts about themselves and others. Dialectical behavioral therapy, or DBT, is similar to CBT, except that it focuses on regulating emotions and being mindful. And then here is your mnemonic for antisocial. And you guys have probably all seen The Simpsons. Um, I probably haven't seen The Simpsons, honestly. So I can't even tell you what this guy's name is, but apparently he's an antisocial personality disorder. And you can see why based off his lack of empathy, no regard for others, feeling like the world uh, or viewing the world in a hostile environment, not really thinking about consequences. So all of those that would come with antisocial. All right, that concludes cluster B. Cluster C, personality disorders, are our anxious and fearful behaviors. So we'll look at avoidant, dependent, and obsessive compulsive. <coughs> so the first one is avoidant personality disorder. Prevalence is 2.4%. These patients are extremely sensitive to rejection. They feel inadequate and they are socially inhibited. They avoid interpersonal contact due to fears of rejection or criticism. And again, that prevalence is 2.4, really equal for males and females in this one. As far as characteristics, early symptoms can usually be seen in our infants and children. Um, infants have that, they just don't bond well with their um, parents. Shyness increases through adolescent, low self-esteem with that inability to function in social situations. They have that feeling of inferiority, reluctant to engage with new people in unfamiliar environments. Um, if support systems fail, they can suffer from depression, anxiety, and anger, and they're very preoccupied with rejection, hum humiliation, and then failure. So as far as guidelines for nursing care, um, we want to be friendly, accepting, and have a reassuring approach. But we need to remember not to push them. Um, pushing them into social situations can cause a lot of anxiety for these patients. Be acceptance, uh, accepting of their fears. Um, and exercise enhances new social skills, but use caution because a failure 
can increase that feeling of poor self-worth. And then assertiveness training can help with one uh, can help one to learn how to express their needs. As far as treatment modalities for avoidance, we can think about individual therapy. Individual and group therapy is useful for anxiety provoking situations and then how to handle them. We want to make sure we're building trust <coughs> and focusing our treatment on assertive training. We can also think about group therapy. Anti-anxiety agents may reduce social anxiety and feel less sensitive to uh, rejection. And then our antidepressants can be helpful to reduce hyperactivity. So our avoidant personality disorder mnemonic is ridicule there. And it'll help you just solidify some of those signs and symptoms that you might see with this personality disorder. So the next one we're going to talk about is dependent personality disorder, um, pattern of submissive and clingy behaviors related to overwhelming need to be taken care of. This results in intense fear of separation. The prevalence is about 0.5%. Characteristics include a high need to be taken care of, which leads to pattern of submissiveness with fears of separation and abandonment by others. Because of these patterns, they may manipulate others to assume responsibility for activities related to finances or child rearing. So I need for you to take care of me because I don't know how to manage my finances, right? So it's that manipulating to get people to take responsibility for some of their things they need to be taking care of. They also have an intense anxiety when they are left alone, even if it's just for a very brief period of time. So as far as nursing guidelines, we want to help identify and, I, and address the stressors um, that may be currently going on with them. Set limits that don't make the patient feel punished. Be aware of countertransference because the patient's demand for extra time and crisis state of mind Right, so they may suck you in, so be aware of that countertransference. And we need to role model that assertiveness. As far as treatment, um, psychotherapy is the treatment of choice. We can think of CBT, um, again, that unhealthy thinking um, and challenging thoughts that result in feel fearful behaviors. There are no specific medications for this personality disorder. And your mnemonic for dependent is darn hurt. Again, looking at those signs and symptoms that would lead you to dependent personality disorder. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder is characterized by limited emotional expression, stubbornness, perseverance, and indecisiveness. They have a preoccupation with orderliness, perfectionism, and control. So the difference between obsessive compulsive disorder, which are the obsessive thoughts and the repetition and rituals, versus obsessive compulsive personality disorder is the unhealthy focus on perfectionism. Two to 8% prevalence, males greater than females, older siblings greater than subsequent siblings. Characteristics, main pathological personality trait is rigidity and inflexible standards <clears throat> for self and others. They rehearse over and over how they will respond in social situations. They persist in excessive goal seeking long after it's necessary, even if it's self-defeating or relationship defeating. They're preoccupied, um, their preoccupa preoccupation results in losing the point of the activity. So they're preoccupied, preoccupied to the point where they don't even know what their activity is anymore. They have strict standards that will make projects incomplete or overdue. So these are the ones that you give them a project. Um, it's two days late because their standards aren't meeting the requirements of the, what they've put together. They have an unhealthy focus on perfection. So guidelines for nursing care. We need to guard against power struggles. The need for control is really high 
for them, right? Because they, they've got to be in control. Remember that the patient has difficulty dealing with unexpected changes. So if they have a schedule, don't change the schedule. So we need to provide structure. Um, make sure we have they have time to complete any habitual behaviors that need to be done. As far as treatment, patients do seek help because they are aware that they're suffering. They also seek treatment for anxiety or depression. Group therapy and behavioral therapy can be helpful with learning coping skills. Clomipramine and Prozac can help reduce some of those obsessions, anxiety, and depression. And here is the last mnemonic for you for obsessive compulsive personality, low mirth. And then again, we'll just walk you through those signs and symptoms. And that concludes chapter 24 on personality disorders. If you have any questions, you can send me an email or we will chat about it in class. Thanks, guys.